I'm Joyce Bassett, and I want to thank my sponsors, NSK and 3M. I will get into the NSK hand pieces a little bit later into the program, but I do want to say that the products that I use here, I use in everyday dentistry. And so it's not like an infomercial because people want to know why and how, why am I successful? Why do I have longevity of my materials and my restorations, et cetera. And I really think a lot of it is the way we handle um, the preparation design, but it's also the companies and the manufacturers and the products that we use. If we use the best products, we're going to have more longevity if we utilize them appropriately. And so NSK, I have an NSK room now where I cut off all my restorations in that room and I, I prep all of my big cases with that hand piece. It's my favorite hand piece in, in the operatories. The light's amazing and I, it's really light, so I love it. Okay, we're all dentists on this program. And we look at faces all day long. But where do our eyes go? We look at a full face, but we always go straight nose to chin. And when we look at the nose to chin, we, what do we think? I even want to look closer. And when I look closer, I think, what's wrong? What dentistry has been performed? I look at the pink. I look at the white, the translucency, the surface texture. And I try to figure out what needs to be done to either help restore the smile, or if it's already been restored, what didn't go well? <laughs> if I can tell that it's not imperceptible dentistry. So in this case, where does your eye go? What dentistry was performed? This patient presented with an unsightly composite on the right lateral incisor and a congenitally missing tooth on the other side. Never in her wildest dreams did she think with two restorations that she could look like this. It took me though, seven live exam presentations at the AACD before I passed accreditation. So it wasn't always that easy. I flunked a lot before I figured out how to avoid failures or how to have less complications when I perform dental procedures. And one thing I learned through all of these processes is that I was always looking, but what was I really seeing? And how do I train my eye to see? Because if I can't focus, my focus is gonna determine my reality. Because if I can't see it, then I can't do it. So today we're gonna to train your eyes. We're gonna stop a lot and look and see where your eye sees. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, you go to work on Monday and you're gonna see more than you did from before this presentation. Now, I had this great implant case, but you know, I watch these, these uh, radiographs every year in hygiene. And all of a sudden I'm like looking at this bone and it's been eight years and the bone is starting to go away. And it's all the way up to the fifth thread. And I keep thinking, oh my God, another flunk. I'm a loser. You know, what did I do wrong? Is there retained cement on the implant? Because that's what they say is really bad of us, uh, us restorative dentists. And how do I avoid failure so that this doesn't happen? If we leave resin cement, it's five times worse than using a bioactive cement or a glass ionomer cement uh, if it gets onto the root surface. And so this is where we're going to be using our glass ionomer cement, Reliax, from 3M if we're going to have to use a cement retained restoration. If we can't um, do you know, a cement, we have to do a cement retained and we don't want excess cement, then we're going to make an analog of the abutment like a practice tooth. And then we're gonna take the crown, and this is how you make the analog. You can inject PVS bite registration inside of a crown, and you're gonna put a stick inside of it. And then that's gonna be your practice crown, custom analog of the abutment. That's your analog. You put the cement on the crown, you put it over the top, it squishes all out, and then you take that crown and stick it on the abutment in the mouth. And that's the best way to probably guarantee or have a higher or less predictability higher predictability, less of a chance of failure with excess cement. And again, you're going to be using the proper cements, GI cements for this case for implants. But this case wasn't an, a, a cementic crown. It was a screw retain crown. I still lost all that bone. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what did I do wrong? No, what am I learning? And so today I'm going to share a lot of information with you. And you can always tell a really smart and experienced dentist, but you just can't tell him or her anything. So for this presentation, I'm really hoping that you don't find the one thing you don't like that I say, because we're going to go into everything today. 
quick, fast, cliff note version, dummy it down. And we're going to see where the failure is in the diagnosis. Is the failure in the planning or is the failure in my treatment? What it, did I do something wrong along the way? We're going to focus on concepts and solutions. When these patients come in, they have this chronic mental illness. They can't stop thinking about a flaw. It's minor. It's tiny. It's imagined. And they have body dysmorphic disease. And they have body dysmorphic of the incisal edge of number seven. They look in the mirror. They see flabby arms. They look at themselves in the, in the mirror on their butt. It's too big. They, and it's not that big. They can't stand to look in the mirror and see ugly. It all started with Jessica Rabbit. It was a cartoon character. She was in all the movies. And she was hot and sexy. And she had these really big heart-shaped breasts that were really high. And then the lips got bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, we got the Kardashian. And so this look is starting to project out a very cosmetic, uh, media-generated appearance. And my patients, they want to look like that. And so sometimes I have to figure out how do I get them to give them the kind of restorations that they want when they really want to look like this. They can come in and there's too much fillers in their lips. I can't even get cotton rolls up, let alone a rim lock tray. And back in the day, Everybody looked more normal, and now people are getting more freak disorders, too much zygoma. So it's not good. So we have to help our patients come into the middle of the bell curve. But if they don't want that, then how do we give them the restorations and the look they want? And that's what we're going to talk about today. A lot of times they come in looking normal, and how do I avoid these failures in this shape? First, we're going to talk about shape. When I overcontrol the restorations at the gingival margins to give them the bulge design, Everything at the bottom of the screen is going to be articles that these, that these come from, all of the words come from. It's going to prevent access for oral hygiene. It's going to provide mechanical pressure. And the patient's resistance factors are critical. And so when they're in hygiene and in the composite prototype provisionals, I have to make sure they can keep the gums clean. And they keep pink gums. And they don't get red and roll. They don't let the food sit there. I'm still going to prep the margin in the right place, three millimeters from the facial, four from the interproximal, but they have to keep it clean. And if they can't keep it clean, then they have to flatten the restorations. When they're all done and they're coming in for recare, my hygienist even knows that she has to reinforce this, this piece. This is a hygiene check. This is a soca brush or some kind of a brush that has a pointy tip on it that you can get inside of the areas and they have to keep these areas clean. When they're super full, I used to just put a perioprobe on the right, perioprobe on the left, make it fuller, make it fatter. Now I add flowable composite, and then they sign off on the restorations so I can exactly give the prototype of what I want my ceramics to do. So how do I tell what my patient wants as far as the white goes? Who is my patient? How do I avoid failures in color? So color is patient-driven. They have these big white teeth, and then I take that... BL1 color shade tab and I put it up by the eye and I take a picture and I send it to the patient and I make sure, are you sure you want this to be the same as your eye? Because when you compare the color of the eye and you compare it to the color of the teeth, the teeth should not be whiter than this color of the eye. And if the patient wants it, that's okay. Then she chooses it and then she's not coming back and go, oh, you made my teeth too white or they're not white enough. These are techniques that I utilize. Then they own the color. They own the aesthetic revolution. Because if it's too white, sometimes it can look worse. While I'm up there with that shade tab, I'm looking at their eyelashes and I'm seeing how big they are. And if they look like a spider and when you put the glasses on, it kind of hits their eye, then I'm kind of thinking pretty much white, maybe even toilable white. And that means monochromatic from top to bottom and the whitest that we can get on our Emacs restorations. And that's how I choose my, choose my colors for my veneers. Now, when I go into the composite prototype provisionals, and I call them composite prototypes, even though they're BIS-GMA, I put global composite on them. So it's a combination. And I start with the 3M bleach. It's the whitest white out there. It's kind of close to the toilet bowl white <laughs> and then I let them stain it over time now if I'm thinking that they don't want the whitest white I'm going with Bisco's BL2 because that's their their bleach is closer to the two on the shade tabs and if I think it's, I don't want to be one and I want to be L3 then I'm going with Ivacar's bleach three it's Telio and then if I think it's going to be a four 
BL4 or B1, I'm back to the 3M products. And those are my composite BIS GMA prototypes that I'm utilizing when I am doing these restorations. Then I tell them to go out and drink coffee, smoke some cigars and drink some red wine and they stain them. And they come back in at the color that they like. And then I take a picture. If they get too yellow, then I take the stain off. I pick the color that they choose. I take a photograph, I send it to the ceramist and I go, this is the color they want. And that's the photo that they get. And the patient signs off on the color. Now this patient, she stained her provisionals on the maxillary teeth to match the existing mandibular dentition. And they were the same color. So I go, great, she's gonna pick this color. She didn't like it. You know, I spent all this money. I want my teeth whiter. I don't care if they don't match. She chose it. So when her restorations were complete, her upper teeth that are porcelain are whiter than her lower teeth. Those are her final porcelain restorations. I can't choose it, different color. Now, what does she do? She comes in once a year and we do a whitening procedure on her on the lower dentition with a power bleacher with Philip Soon. Or she could use at-home trays, and in this case, she won't do it, so she comes in with a power bleacher. And this is how I enhance restorative outcomes going forward, and she knows it, she owns it. Some people think that it's too sensitive, so you have to be careful that you cover the gingival margins with the dam. I don't know if you can see my little light go on, I don't know if you can. And then at the incisal edges, if they've got wear, cover them. Don't let the whitening gel get into that area. Now I have to take photographs, and this is my photo studio. When they look to the right, they see Brad Pitt. When they look to the left, they see the beautiful Victoria's Secrets model. They sit on my Ohio State Buckeye pillow. I make them laugh. And I tell them, show me their gums. Because I need to take, I take all the photos. I need to see everything when they're, when they're having their restorations accomplished. But I always say a camera is like riding a bike. And you really have to use your camera. All right. So this is a camera. And then the camera, I use the DS. LR, it's a digital single lens reflect. These are for the best pictures that you could possibly have because I need to lecture and publish and I need to have a really good quality. And I have, a, it's very expensive and it's heavy and there's a learning curve, but you can learn it. I use a dual point flash, right side to left side. And it gives you the 3D text, texture and the topography. Getting the light in the back in the back is difficult. So sometimes people would want to get a ring light for the back. Now a ring flash is good for the back, but it's inconsistent. And when you do a frontal shot, you're going to get some, some shadowless lightning in the back. So this is a ring flash on a full face photography. And you can see how in the background, it doesn't look good. And so now you have to make sure you use the right camera in the right places to have really good photos. With this camera, we have a polarized filters now that you can put on, side, on top of it. And when you take a picture with the polarized filter, it blocks out some of the light. And then the ceramics, if they're matching color, can match the, the dentition much, much better using a polarized filter. Also, we have eLab now, where they give you the gray card and you take a specific picture with the gray card in the right orientation and then they take this and send it to the ceramist in raw format and then they can put it the software into the computer and they can find a formula for the porcelain so that they can match better it's almost like a paint chip and you go to home depot and so these are the different techniques in photography that will help you match color better when you're doing single unit restorations or multiples into the dentition now digital small design is all new how do we maximize and leverage all this new breakthrough technology? So as dentists, we, all we do all day is collect physical data. We have to capture it. We collect it. Then we have to design what we're going to make, and then we're going to manufacture it. So we're going to talk about the analog world, which is a lot of us are in, and definitely from dental school, going into the digital world. So we're going to compare everything. So in capturing it in the analog world, we're going to talk about impressions that we take, models, dyes, and bite registrations. We design it, and that's going to be with your waxing and making your matrices, and this is your analog world, and then we manufacture it. In the old-fashioned world, we had a BlackBerry. It's like analog technology. And then we keep getting updates and updates and updates. And all of a sudden, now we're in the digital, the highest rank digital, where our cameras and our videos are better on the cameras and sometimes the other cameras that we have. And the newest is with the latest in technology. We can't even get the old analog world anymore. And I think over time, 
the way we do some of the dentistry today is going to be obsolete. Everything's going to go totally digital. So we have to learn how to utilize it and how to implement it into our practices. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit in the beginning here. So iOS, what is iOS? What's CAD CAM? So we're going to capture data in a different way. And we have impressions. And now in the digital world, we have iOS. But no matter what we're doing, we're capturing the same data. iOS means interoral scanner. And when we have an interoral scanner, it can produce a digital file. It can be an STL smile, a file which is monochrome, or ply color, which has got all these colors in it. And that's your scan. Now, you can also take your impression and put it in a bench scanner, and then it can scan it there. Or you could take the model and put it in a bench scanner, and you can scan it there. Now, in my case here, in my scanner, and I have an iTero, you have four different ways that you can press a button. So once it gets scanned, the top button will show me my crown preparation. The next button is going to mark my margins for me. The next button is going to make it look like stone, which I kind of like to look at stone because I've always looked at the analog world. And then the fourth button is going to tell me if I have enough occlusal reduction, depending on what material I've chosen. And it looks like an occlusal gram. And what's great about this technology is they say, oh, it fits better when you go in the digital world and you scan. Well, I think that they're saying now the reason why it's fitting better is because today we're making better impressions of our preps because we can see it really, really big and we can see if it's crap in, a port, in an area and we can fix it before we send it to the lab. There's a lot of times, and this is a wonderful impression material from 3M, but a lot of times you look down in the bottom and you won't even know there's a pull and, and you, you'll get a call from the lab and they go, hey, what do we do with this impression? You know, margins are good, but it's pulled and do we use it or how does it work? So in this case, we can send this file, we can make sure it's perfect or we can even see it super big. So that's some of the positive things that are gonna occur going digital as far as scanning technology for your preparations and sending them to the laboratory. So we talked about data collection. That's our first part. The second part is called CAD and it's computer assisted design. And then we have design studio software. So there's all kinds of software programs and our software could be ExoCAD, Cirac, 3Shape, Simplant, Blue Sky Bio. So depending on your designer and some people are designing themselves, depends on what kind of a program they have and how in depth their program is. The third thing is CAM computer assisted machining. This is your program mill one. This is from the um, Ivo Clark and you can do 3D printing, zirconia milling, Emacs milling. You can make dentures, you can make splints, you can make models, all kinds of things in the CAM program. So the principles are the same, but how we do it is different. So let's review the principles first. And I hope that everybody when I'm done better understands all of this technology. So I'm dumbing it down a little, but it'll go faster as we go. Dental facial treatment planning. The first and the most important thing is where the incisal edge position is, the master incisal edge position. I put it in the mouth, your front tooth. Then you look at it in the face. If it's right, it looks right, then it is right. So it has to look right. So you choose where you want that edge to be. In the analog world, I would put composite. I would take a picture. I want it this long. You can also use a smile like template in the analog world, put it over the top of the teeth. This is over the top. I'm opening up a vertical. I'm going to do a whole upper arch. So I can take that, take a picture of that. I can also take a face bow of that. And then when I do the face bow, that's the upper member of the articulator. Remember that's the canteen. And then I have the marks of where I would like my edges to be. So the ceramist knows where to start waxing up the case. If you're going analog, that's your imprint guide. Now, we have historically Kino where we use retractors. We put the tooth in there and it's, we used a computer. And now all of this technology that we use from Kino and the Ample went into the ExoCAD or three shape in the computer software. You just take a picture. We'll talk about head positioning and posturing with different kinds of glasses and retractors so that we can take one picture and probably do just about everything you need with one or two pictures. We're the architect still. And I'm going to share information with you now. For me, I'm outsourcing my CAD and my CAM. So you're going to see everything working, but I'm going to get the screenshots from my ceramist, the designer, and I'm going to bring it to the practice and explain it to the patients and have it as a record. But I outsource CAD CAM. Some people in their offices, they're doing all the design. 
they're manufacturing themselves. I'm still going to explain how it all occurs. But again, I'm outsourcing. I outsource my root canals. I out outsource my TMD. And so that's kind of how my practice is. But we're still going to cover everything. So in-house, I'm not doing. But as I said, other people can. Now, you can always tell an experienced dentist. You just can't tell him or her anything. So don't find the one thing that you don't like that I'm saying because things keep changing. And I'm just going to give you where we're at in 2021 as we move into the future. And it's not going to be one pearl. I'm sure it's going to be a string of pearls because you're going to pick up some things I hope that you don't know. So turn your phones upside down. Focus with me. You never get lost if you don't know where you're going. And that's your GPS in your car. So this is what's good about this technology is because it's going to do the same thing. It's going to guide us through the procedure. I worry about is it too robotic? Am I going to lose artistry? So let's talk about it with a really difficult case and how we do complex digital smile design. I'm not going to show an easy case because we're not going to learn anything on an easy case. So here's our patient. She presents. And if you look at her radiographs, the posterior dentition is a hopeless prognosis. And so we're going to lose a lot of those teeth. We're going to place implants. And so we're going to start the case by just designing the smile in the front. She has wear, eruption, and erosion. We're not going to address those in this case. But she has a rotated tooth. So she has a space size discrepancy from the right to the left and she has rotations. And so remember, when you have a rotation, I always tell the patient, do you want everything perfect? Because if you do, you have to get ortho because when you have rotations, that side is going to be skinnier or thinner than the other side. So that means if you want contralateral exactly the same, we're going to have to do something else. So I'll tell the patient right off the bat, she goes, no, I'm fine. I don't care. It's all right, just work with what I have. So I have these verbiages occurring in my consultations. So we have these tooth libraries. They have all different styles and forms and shapes, and they're two-dimensional. And remember, we're putting two-dimensional on a picture on a computer screen. It's not 3D. It's a computer screen. It's different than taking an analog model and rolling it in your hand. But we're going to take these two-dimensional forms, and we're going to set the midline first, right down the center. And then we're going to separate the right side to the left side, but keep the same proportions. And we're going to fit the left side into the patient's left side, all the two forms. Then we're going to bring the right central incisor in, in the same proportion. Then we're going to bring the right lateral in, in the same proportion. Then the right canine in. And now when we look at this, those are the same proportions. They don't fit in the teeth on the right-hand side. I got a problem. If they sit in the teeth, this is what they look like. So I have this situation, but I want this situation. So what am I going to do? Got a problem right there. Now we know when we see different widths on that side and we go into preparation design, we're going to open up contacts there because we're going to have to change width. So I'm always thinking, what am I going to do when I prep? How am I going to do this case? So we connect the dots on those. Now we're going to go to the lowers and we have a big diastema on the bottom. Thank you. And we can see that diastema and we can take that and move that center to the patient's right. And that means we can also move the midline to the patient's right side. And that helps because then we can create more space and equalize the right to the left. And so we're going to open up those contacts because we're going to change the width. And then we're going to put the lower teeth templates in. They fit in perfect. And that is what we have. And that's as good as it gets. And we can also take these photos and show them to the patient, screenshot them. If you want to communicate with them, I usually don't because it causes too much slowing me down to get down, done what I need to do. Now I'm going to take these and put them in her face. And then I'm going to show you how it goes into the technology. Now it's three shape is all together. So we don't have to go to keynote. It's all built into three shape. And this is going to be my ceramist that is going to design. We turn the translucency off so we can see through it. And this is Rob. It's a really nice design on the cusp, but we like the shape of it. But guess what? The teeth is not underneath it. We have this whole area out here where we're promising something we can't deliver. So we're going to have to readapt this design back to the tissue, which is there. Here on this tooth, tissue is right there. So we can't overpromise it under deliver where before we would get a wax up and they would wax it over the top of the teeth. And then we put it in the face and we would start trimming in and it didn't look good. 
Well, they can't do that anymore because they can see through it. So that's one thing that's great. So things are much more correct. This is how a third of the two to be full. So I know there's three planes on a, on a central and a lateral. And to me, it's too flat right there. I like so fat this, teeth right this, there. This one's not a bug. This one hasn't been yet. So let's pinch that one and bring it out the other one. So what you're seeing here is they're taking a mouse and they're moving it. They're not using a waxing instrument. And it takes 10 years to learn how to wax restorations and to learn how to do direct composite bonding. And Christian Coachman says it takes six months in DSD to learn how to design. And I think a lot of the younger generation dentists are designing themselves. They're going to the sick technology. They're printing their own models and they're designing this and it's not going to the ceramist as much as it used to. So things are going to go in that manner moving forward. I worry about lost in translation because some of those line angles and curves are lost between the wax up and coming out. So we do need a really good ceramist that can go in there and do some of the contours. Here's our pre to our post, completed case, digitally designed. So what are the applications? Here's another case. This patient comes in, she presents with a really gummy smile. This is all published, so I'm only picking the digital design pieces out for this presentation. And so here we are designing the dentition, and when we're done designing it, we can have a proposal that's both for the veneers and for the periodontal surgery in the same design proposal. Now we can take it, press the button, we have the CAD CAM, now this is a CAM, we're going to machine it and we can mill it out of a PMMA and we can use that PMMA and give it to the surgeon that does the perio surgery and he can use it as a gingival reduction guide for what's required. Here's the surgical template and then we can also press a button and mill it out of white wax and when it's milled out of white wax we can glue it to a second analog model for the wax up then we can make our Siltex stint and we can use our best GMA 3M material bleach inside of it. And now when we make sure that the PVS materials like that, make sure they cut it out on the gum line so you can get rid of the excess so it seats really good and it goes super quick. And here's your bisacolic resin over the top of the restorations. And that's how I like to use it because I personally will like add flowable composite on it. I don't like the PMMAs. They don't bond well for me unless I'm doing implant cases. So I like to use the BIS GMA products. And again, you can read more about the whole case in Dentistry Today. It's on my website, smilesbyjoyce.com. So what are the updates? Here's a digital wax up that was performed. And what do I do? I still put composite on that front tooth. I still put composite on that bicuspid that so the ceramist knows how full I want it. Then when they go to design and I'm taking all the pictures that they need, then they put the design in, but they know exactly where I want the incisal edge of nine, even in the composite prototype, this GMA temporaries. And then they're gonna do their digital wax up and it looks like that. Now I never show this to the patient. Why? Because I think it looks like Halloween. I don't like the way the teeth look. I think it would lose the case for me. So I just do that with my ceramist. But now the updates, we have nice, pretty white teeth. So it's starting to look a lot better, which is kind of nice. I like to use flowable composite on my BIS GMA temporaries. And so this is my flowable composite and I'm going to change the shapes. I'm going to make eight a different shape than nine just by using the line angles. And the patient's going to go home and look at the right side and the left side and go, you know what? I like nine better than eight. I like it fatter. And so then I add flowable composite on eight until they pick a tooth that they like and the way that it looks when they like it. This is the art of customization. Then I polish it with my wheels and my patients always go, when am I going to get my teeth? And I say, when are you going to sign off? I will have this on the Catapult website. All of my approval for my placement of temporaries. And now I think I write provisional restorations. And this, they have to accept the, everything that they accept, eight or nine. And it goes to the lab, laboratory before they start making the case. And I take a scan or an impression of this to send so they have something to guide them. This is what my laboratory prescription looks like. I'll put my two fingers between eight and nine and go, which one do you like better? I try to get them the same. They like nine more than eight. Then I write it on the laboratory prescription. I do the same thing with seven and 10. And you can utilize all of these techniques with two teeth or four teeth or 10 teeth. 
And so I always have them approved, especially if your patients are super selective. It's really important. So I always write it. And here she is in her, her restorations that are approved, but they're her temporaries. So now how do I go from here to the final? Here's her provisionals. And now I need natural head posture. So we have these glasses from the Coist Center and we have retractors. And when you look at these glasses, they're red right on the top, green on the bottom. So if you see a color when you're taking a picture, they're tilted down or tilted up. It's not good. So you find the picture where it's tilted down and that's the picture they're going to use to design. Also between the glasses, 140 millimeters. So if they need to have any of that, they can have it in the digital photography. And now the new glasses have yellow. And the yellow is these little bubbles right to left. And now you can do front to back with the red and the green. So now you're going to get your natural head posture. What do I talk about analogs world? Obsolete. People are going to stop taking face balls, take a couple of pictures, send it in. There's also virtual articulators. So they can put everything on the articulator. They can optimize and evaluate the functional envelope, bite it up and down, right, lateral, protrusive. Everything can be done on the uh, virtual articular. Here's her final. It's customized. It's hybrid of analog and digital, and it needs a dentist. So you need to learn how to do this stuff. You can't just think the computer's going to do it. How do we avoid implant failures? And those are all implants that came out of my practice, uh, that came to my practice that I took my own pictures on. So now we have CBCT technology, and we can treatment plan from the face back to the restoration. And we have CBCT, we have our scanners, we have our design studio software, and then we can go ahead and mill. Again, I'm outsourcing my design, and this is Brian. I love him, and he's microdental. And how do I maximize and leverage this technology? So even though he's designing it, I'm going to use the technology when I'm talking to my patient. This is my front desk area. There's a camera that goes to the front waiting room. It was perfect for COVID because I have two waiting rooms. You walk down this long hallway all these pictures of people's faces and that are smiling. And I think it's important if you're doing these kinds of cases to have your patient pictures in your practice somewhere for marketing purposes, rounding the corner. And this is where they check out, where they're checking out and paying money. I always put all my diplomas up there, any kinds of articles that you publish. If you're ADA or whatever you are, put it there, leave it there. Um, AGD, so that they know that you have extra training when they're going to pay. It makes them feel better about paying. When you're around the corner, I have a consultation room. You have to have a room that you sit with the patient in. And if you don't have your own room, then you sit them out of the operatory chair and you look at a computer screen together sitting next to each other. Everything happens in that consultation room, sitting next to the patient, looking at the pictures. Now, here's a patient when she smiles. She just gets presented to me. And, and the guy goes, hey, we need some implants in this case. Okay, fine. So she's smiling and they sent them to me because I really want to get the tissue perfect. And they know I'm going to go through the extra steps to have this accomplished. High smile line, high risk aesthetics. I'm going to scan it and then all of a sudden they're going to design. When the design comes to me, I always want a screw retain restoration. So they give me the design with a screw retain. They give me the design with the cement retain. And I don't know what that looks. I don't know what that means. So I call the guy up. I pick up the phone. I go, explain it to me. And I have them do a couple of screenshots. The goal is a guide for seven and 10 that's going to give you the perfect positioning. Now, I always want to screw retain. Why? Because I don't want any cement, right? And so I get this picture. I also want it to be retrievable because these kids are young, okay? And so what happens is what if you have to get them, you know, get those out? These, these kids are 20, 25. We want them to go till 90. So if it's screw retain, it's retrievable. If you have a problem, you keep the model work and you can always get back in and out and keep the provisional screw retained, temporary, always keep it. Now I always use my hands. If it's a screw retained position, the apex is out the facial, the crown. So I tell the patient, if it's screw retained, it's going to go out like this. And if I move the uh, implants, tip it out. So it's not out the end, then it's going to come out the front of the bone. So even though I want screw retained, you don't have enough bone in there for screw retained. Now there's angled screw channels. If we have time, the last case shows an angled screw channel that you can use to help with these. But in this case, the spaces are so little when you straum in, there's only 2.9, room for 2.9. So there's no angled screw channel. So the patient knows I have to do a cement retained restoration. I'm gonna have to do cement. Now, when she came in, 
I thought the spaces were right between seven and 10. I go, no, I think that they're good. I go, but when we get into the digital technology, we'll be able to see if the laterals, if one's going to be wider than the other by half a millimeter, you see seven and then 6.4. Then if you want, we can add a half a millimeter of composite on the canine, but usually people can't see half a millimeter. And with contours, you'll be good. And seven and 10 laterals could be a little different. It's okay. So from the frontal view, she can see now in the tech, they love looking at the technology, the difference in the two sides, and then she can decide in the temporaries if she really cares about the width. Now the standard emergence profile is three to four millimeters deep from the head of the implant is what you're looking at. And in this case, we have 6.4, five and 6.4 from the top of the implants. And so it's gonna be difficult to predict the pink because it's a little bit, it can be not predictable. So I explained to the patient, if you want a perfect with the high spine line, I'm gonna have to develop the site. And I'm gonna develop the site in a temporary, screw retained restoration and let the tissue heal. And then I can see where it's gonna be. And then I'll be happier at the end and you'll be happier. We'll be able to know what we can do. I customize it with flowable composite. I can unscrew it. I can take the tissue up. I can take the tissue down. I can control the contour and the provisionals. I can put them back into the mouth. And then you can see here how one side is lower than the other side. I want the tissue to go up. And sometimes I can't remember everything because I'm getting older and I always try to remember things that are funny. So I remember. And I always think the bigger the belly, especially when I eat too much, the higher the tissue goes. And so if the higher tissue goes up, I want the tissue to go up. I want the belly of that gingival margin at the zenith to be fuller. So I'm going to take it out and add flowable composite. Once I get the levels even, for me, I take a custom impression copy. So I unscrew one at a time. And once I unscrew it, I put immediately, unscrew the temporary, I put the custom impression copy in and I place flowable composite along the gingival margins to hold the tissue in place so it doesn't collapse. And then I do the other one. Then I take my impression. Now you can use a scanner. You have to do a double scan. I don't want to teach that because I don't utilize it for that, for that way. I like custom impression copings personally. I haven't gone into the analog, the digital world for that. But doing it this way, I have predictable abutments that the line is going to be the same as far as the zenith of seven and ten being more even with a high smile line. So when they smile, I'm happier with the final restorations. And that's how I avoid failures for implant restorations. And again, if you have to do screw retain, or if you have to do cement, use a GI uh, cement. Remember that if you're going to have to cement that one. And that was cemented. Your focus determines your reality. Now we're going to train your eye. These are two beautiful movie stars. They have something in common. And can you tell what they have in common when you look at their faces? Because we're looking at their faces. So when we look at faces, we can divide them into threes, one thirds, or we can look at the golden rule of proportion. And you can see where they're cut, the thirds and the golden rule. So doliocephalic skeletal types, they have long adenoidal facial appearances. And they both have doliocephalic facial types. But what do they look different? Why do they look a little different? Because of the hair. Jennifer covers her hair. Women know what to do if they don't like the way something looks. We know how to create illusion. So our focus determines our reality. How do we create illusion in teeth? Look at the smile. Where does your eye go? What did I do? How many restorations were performed? She presented with the lateral incisor missing on the left side, congenitally missing lateral incisor, number 10. And we finished this case with six restorations and it's published in compendium. N now, let's evaluate it. She has a low smile line on the left side, thank you. 
kind of covers that left side, low risk aesthetics on the left, and that's a problem area. High on the right side, all the way back to the gingival margins of number three. And uh, if we look at the cupid's bow in the center, you can see it's all the way over to the patient's right. There's a space size discrepancy. And from an occlusal perspective, you can see a missing lateral incisor and a rotated bicuspid. She wants a minimal amount of teeth to be touched and she wants them restored. So of course, I'm gonna go, you go to the braces guy, go get ortho, move the lateral, the canine over, create space. She goes, no, she went to the ortho and she says, no. I go, go to the implantologist, you know, the perio guy, and let's go ahead and put some implants in. And she goes to the guy and she goes, no, I'm not going through all that, I'm too old. I've lived with this forever. I know it's gonna be a compromise case, but I don't care. So what do they do to us? They handcuff us, right? all the time. So I write into my chart, refuses this, refuses that, understands how do we minimize the compromise? What do I do? Just because you won't do the right thing doesn't mean I have to do the wrong thing. So I always say that I go, but I'm going to do the best I can. So let's go to smile design. Let's look at it the new way. Let's look at the illusion. To understand we have to understand our classics. We have to understand everything about smile design in order to create these illusions. So we're gonna go through smile design quickly. So 75 to 80% is a central width to height. That's, I always call it eight by 10 rule. And the centrals can be square. And it means the middle of the tooth looks like a square and you can have square, square, square round on the edges. The next shape it can be is ovoid which is the distal of the tooth, has a curve in it, and usually the bottom is. And then triangular, which I don't like ever. And it's the same with different male body types and female body types. Apples, pears, hourglasses, different shapes. They're all beautiful. There's nothing wrong. They're all beautiful. But people wear different kinds of clothes to kind of camouflage what they look like. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use different shapes to change and camouflage. So I always look at it, the incisal edges. So patients always say, what are you gonna do? And we'll look at my fake fingernail. It's big and it's fat and it's square and it's very cosmetic. And then that's from Flagstaff, it's round and it looks natural. So we're gonna mess with the edges. We're gonna change the edges a little bit. We have all of these options, round, round, square, round, square, square. And now let's look at how we utilize these. So from our frontal perspective, if you look at the different embrasures on this patient's right side to the patient's left side, that you can see the number 10 tooth is opened up and it makes it appear more narrow when you open up the embrasures. When you close the embrasures, it makes them look wider, the tooth. So remember all this because we're going to utilize this as we move. Then we change the angles, narrow inverted in the front and the asymmetrical on the left and wide inverted going into the canines. We can change those angles also. When we look at that, we're looking at a frontal perspective, but we also have to look at it from an incisal perspective. So we're looking at the top. Is it concave? Is it totally flat where it's kind of wishy-washy on the line angles or is it convex? How does our eye see concavity? It makes the tooth look thinner. Flatness or wideness, it makes it look wider and flat somewhere in the middle. So that's how we change the width of the tooth by changing those line angles on the tops. This is your illusion. So again, this is what I utilize all the time. Changing the line angles, those preps underneath are exactly the same. You see triangular on the top of number eight. You see more square on number nine. So changing the line angles, changing the outline forms, changes the look of the teeth. Symmetry is a mirror image of parts and components. That means you take it, you pull it over the top of each other and it matches perfect. Harmony is a recurring theme. Twins are symmetry. Harmony is sisters. That's my smile. Everybody likes my teeth. They think they're really pretty. But when I do dentistry on my patients, they think they want harmony, but a lot of times they want symmetry and you find them looking very denture-like and perfect and that's what they want. So I explain that to patients. I utilize myself all, all the time, especially if I 
need to shorten laterals because of occlusion and, and chewing forces and, and pathway issues. So I explain it to patients so they have longevity to their restorations. Now we have the golden rule of proportion, which we had forever. It came from way back in the day in architecture. And really basically what it means is like the lateral is 60% the width of the central and the canine is 60% of the width of the lateral from a frontal perspective. And some people don't like the golden proportion. So along the way, other proportions came around and another one is called the continuous proportion. And what it is is finding a proportion that you like and you choose and you take it from the center all the way to the back and you copy to the other side. So this case is continuous proportion. And when you put the two cases together, then you can see this is a golden proportion on the left of your screen compared to continuous proportion on the right. So you can decide what you like. I personally think golden proportion looks more fat, masculine, which is to the left side. And then the other one looks a little bit more feminine. That's my own perception. And it's up to you how you want to handle and you want to design your cases. It's good to know all these things though. Now I'm going to analyze the outline forms. So we're going to go to digital technology. So I'm not going to get handcuffed, no handcuffs. I'm going to figure out how to make this look as good as possible. And I'm going to utilize everything. I'm going to break through this technology. So I'm going to take the existing outline tooth forms and do the same thing as I did the other ones and put them together and just outline them. Then I'm going to use continuous proportion. So I'm going to take the right side of the patient, left side of your screen. She doesn't want those teeth change. She likes number five and number six. She doesn't want me touching them. And they're beautiful teeth. I don't want to prep those teeth. I want to do minimally invasive dentistry. So I'm going to take the left side of the patient and mimic it from the, to the patient's right. Cut and paste it and move it over to the other side. Now we can see it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. We're going to go ahead and move the midline to the patient's left because we need more space over there, just like in the other case that I showed you. Open up the contact, move it over, and start to make 7 and 10 look more of the same width. How much can we move it over? Only so much. We have to respect the pink papilla. So now we're going to move it over to the patient's left. Open up the contact, you know, when we prop. And now we have to fit the template inside the tooth at the gingival margins. Now we're worried about how full those have to be. I mean, look at they're way out there. And we're concerned. That's a lot. A way, big way to go. But thank God it's under the gum line. Now we have to worry about the bulge design. And we have to talk to them about the gingival margins. And can they keep it clean? And does it matter to them? So this is where you're in your provisionals talking to the patient. Now we're going to lengthen 7 and 10 because remember we want to make them not, you can't tell that they're different. And we want to make them look wider. So we're going to lengthen seven and 10, and then square off those, round off the distal of number 11 to match number six. And then we're done with that piece. And now we're gonna sync the technology and we use these little blue landmarks. And then we analyze the design purport proposal with the pre-op. So we turn it on and turn it off so we can see through it. So it fits the gingival margin. 2D images are entered as overlays and then we have to take the overlay and fit it into the gingival margin. You're going to have a big steepness over on the left side. And then this is our final 3D design proposal. We have a virtual trine of the six restorations. We can put them in our face and we can decide if we like it. And then we go forward, like I said earlier, press the button, make me a wax up, et cetera, et cetera. And the PVS. So you can print the model for your wax up. And you never get lost if you don't know where you're going because now you have your indexes and we know how to prepare over the facials, Pascal Manier and Galique Garoule with our tooth preparation, putting the temporaries over the top and cutting through them. And we have three different guides as we're preparing our teeth. And I'm using the most minimally invasive um, preparation guide over the facials in this case. But what I like to do for this case specifically is before I do that, I'm going to use my incisal matrix because I know that I need to make seven as wide as possible. And I want to make eight on the distal as thin as possible, but you have to respect that pink papilla. So I'm doing my first cuts before I go through the top because I want to respect the papilla and I'm going to cut there first. The goal is imperceptible dentistry. In this case, I hope teaches us that piece of the technology, which is design and preparation design.
Now we're going to speak about material selection. And we have our different ceramic choices. We have feldspathic, this is 2021 choices, lithium to silicate, lucite reinforced, aluminous, zirconia, and PFM. The left side of your screen is glass ceramics, the middle is oxide ceramics, and the right's metal. The left side is weak, the right side is stronger, the left side is translucent, the right side is more opacious. The left side is gorgeous. The right side is not as attractive. So you kind of use the left side in the front and the right side in the back. But let's talk about our lithium to silicate restorations. Full form monolithic is lithium to silicate and it's reinforced 500 megapascals with a toughness of three. We have to be careful how we cut back these materials. The old way was to cut back the incisal edges and then put feldspathic porcelain on them. That's why we kept getting chipping. And even feldspathic porcelain on the edges can chip if they don't have a good substructure. Because this, the feldspathic layering porcelain is only 100 megapascals, where the EMAF lithium to silicate restorations are 500 megapascals in strength. So you want to be careful when you're layering your porcelains. So you want to cut back for incisal translucency, and you better ask your ceramist, how are you cutting back? Leave the back of the edge there. And if you put layering porcelains only on the front. To avoid material failures, there's two kinds. One's cohesive fracture, which is inside the body of the porcelain. And the other one is the chip on the edge with 100 megapascal on the edges. That's the loading of the layering porcelain. Now make sure that you put the feldspathic on the non-loading surface. And these are um, zirconia restorations. I think it's a bridge. And don't do anything full, full monolithic on the incisal edges. I could fix it though. It comes in, it looks like this. I have to fix it. This came from another practice, but it happens to all of us. And he just moved into Phoenix and they were four months old. And so how do I fix it? I can make it look imperceptible. So I'm going to go ahead and roughen it a little bit. I'm going to use my micro etcher on the facial surface with Kojet because it's porcelain and that's a 3M product and it puts uh, glass particles in. I'm gonna use my porcelain etch, I'm gonna use my silane, and then at the very edge, I'm gonna use the whitest XW because I want a white halo effect. And that's the new composite and that's my favorite color on the white halo on the XW from 3M. It just came out, I love it. And then on the facial, you're gonna use whatever color matches. And in this case, it was a B1 on the facial of the 3M product and you're gonna polish it. It's repaired. But what happens if you can't repair them and you have to cut them off? You have to be careful because if you, even with preparations, we can have a lot of problems because 11% of the time you can get pulpal pathology you need to have root canals done with porcelain bonded restoration. This is in my informed consent. And nobody reads it, right? So I tell them about it. And you're gonna have complications even with perfect execution no matter what you do. This is my custom small design. I can also put this on the Catapult website for everybody. And I don't want this to happen. I don't want this many root canals. So we use copious amounts of water when we're cutting off these restorations, even when we're prepping really good diamonds. And this is where I'm using my, my um, aerosol reduction with the flip of a switch because we have to worry about aerosols a lot right now because of um, COVID. And we of course have high speed ev evacuation and I have HEPA filters coming in. But in these hand pieces, you can change the aerosol and you can have a really high when you're cutting it off and then bring the aerosol down. And I did a program with Mike Detola for ages and he is brilliant. I think it's really good to listen to the video on this, on NSK, and this is how I cut him off. Um, it puts out a whopping 4.2 Newton centimeters of torque. That's the highest torque of any electric on the market today. And in today's dentistry, there's really no such thing as too much torque, especially cutting off some of the new high strength all ceramic crowns we have like solid zirconia. Talk to me a little bit about the experience of cutting off these crowns with an electric handpiece versus say like an air rotor. Okay, I always use electric because the air driven 
um, hand pieces, the minute you put it on the tooth or, or on the material, it just doesn't cut well. Right. It can usually, or it'll, stall completely. It'll, or it'll break the burr. The yeah. diamond will die completely or the carbide, whatever you're cutting off with, and usually if they're diamonds, mm -hmm. it'll just totally stop. Now, what I like is an, is an electric hand piece to cut everything off. This hand piece, it just put, you put it on the zirconia, it just cuts right through it. It's like butter, it melts it because it's so much more powerful and you don't have to use a lot of pressure because right. before I had to put a lot of pressure on it and then for Emacs or lithium to silicate, when you have to cut it off, you have to cut the whole thing off because it's right. bonded. So you're kind of reprepping it, your hand really hurts because right. you have to put so much pressure on. Now you don't have to put that much and pressure. And the other nice thing about not having to put so much pressure is when you're really leaning that burr against that zirconia crown, as soon as you get through it, if you're leaning that hard on it, boom, you're right into the tooth. Yeah. And you're like, I was looking at my assistant and I said, I decided to place an anti-rotational groove in the tooth. She goes, oh really? Because it looks like you almost accidentally hemisected it. So you're right, with all the torque that you get from the NLZ motor, you don't have to lean that hard on it, but you can still cut a fit. And I've done that before. I'm sure we've all done it. We get done and we have these little lines in the tooth and we feel like losers and really bad because we like cut, but we can't, it's so hard. So these hand pieces, I love them. I cut everything off. I have my NSK room. If I have to cut restorations off and my team puts them in another operatory, then I'm like, you know, put them, you got to move them in that room. So I really believe that you should have all NSKs, but if you don't have a really good um, electric hand piece, just buy theirs, just buy theirs and get at least one set in one room. And I think you want, you will, it will, you will love it. You will love it. Okay. Informed consent. Sometimes all you learn for me is from Burbage. Because people go, how long is it going to last? How much is it going to cost? And so with the informed consents, like I said, they don't really read them. I say that's an unanswerable question. We have better bonding agents today. We have better materials today. How are you going to handle the restorations? Are you going to wear your night guard? Are you going to do not use your teeth as tools? So it's an unanswerable question, but it's a good question. It's, I can give you a range of answers. Then I also tell them like when I'm going to do a treatment plant, I cannot tell what is under there. I don't know what's under that bridge or under those PFM crowns. There is a chance you need a root canal. There's going to be a chance that you need a buildup. You know, I don't know. So I'm just going to put down a crown for right now. I'll take pictures while I'm doing the procedure. But if there's a chance that, you know, it needs more work done, I'm going to let you know on that day. And so I can't help it if it's more. But I tell them that right on the first appointment when we're going through what they're going to need to have done. In their informed consents and in their emails, I write, patient has given us permission to send this email because I don't want to go to a secure site. I don't like HIPAA. I'm not, I don't like it. I can't work. I use my iPhone all the time. So I ask my patients, is it okay that I send an email? They love it. They read the emails later. They have the x-rays on the emails. They give me permission. And so it works. In my informed consent, I also say, can I email you? Can I text you? Can I send the pictures and the scans to here and to there? Because I use this iPhone consistently all the time. And then again, when I sit side by side with them, I type. Well, I don't type. I'm a terrible typer. There's a PC and two Macs. And so the PC has my dental um, software in it. And my team is typing a Cliff Note version of what it is. And I always say it's like spaghetti on the wall. What sticks? What resonates with you to the patient? You can decide what you want to do. You don't have to take any notes, listen to everything we're saying in our treatment plan. And I have a cosmetic consultation template that I copy and paste in for my new patient consults. And I just write everything like a cliff note version, one, two, three, four. They get rid of the yellow highlights. And then the patient, when you're writing it, they really believe you're listening to them. They understand what's going on, especially when you're like me, I talk too fast. And then they can read it later. And it lets me, allows me to go as fast as I need. At the bottom of it, I have for five units, for 10 units, for full mouth reconstruction, they get rid of what they don't need. They pop it in there if they need it. And then the patient has this along with their full mouth packet. So failure to diagnose, a lot of times I got my scanner, not just so I can not take impressions, because I really still take a lot of analog impressions because I take such good impressions. It's for me to help the patient understand where and movement. I am so frustrated when I'm trying to explain to my patient when they've had tooth movement or wear on the edges. And now finally, I have technology for my terror called time lapse. I take a scan and one year later, I take a second scan. And this technology puts it on top of each other and the patient plays with it and then they can look at it and then it can show from one year to the next how much wear has happened on the canine 
and how much movement on the lateral incisor. So when I have my restorative treatment plan that says you need Invisalign or you need bonding or we need to do something with your bite and your function because we need to intercept early rather than have a catastrophic situation later, I don't have to work anymore. The screen tells them everything. They just sign up. So you can quantify tooth loss now and calculate clinical attachment loss and tooth movement. And so the patient sees it up on the screen. Because otherwise, what level of damage is happening to the teeth before we decide what to do? And this is where we do a risk assessment, which is a choice of inaction. Risk factors increase the chance of a problem occurring. The more risk factors, the more chance. And I always explain to the patient, you have nails on the driveway and you're gonna pull your car out and you have a hundred nails. What's the chance you're going to get a you're going to have a flat tire, and it's going to be a really high chance. So my goal in the dental practice is to get rid of the nails on the driveway so that I have longevity of my restorations. So I tell them you have high risk and low risk. So let's figure out what you're doing and the risk factors that are bad, like that diet, not brushing your teeth, so your high caries risk, or grinding and clenching during the day. All of these things are nails. I'm going to get rid of the nails. I'm going to empower you with knowledge. And then once you know, it's going to reduce the risk and it's going to reverse the problem. And so this is what a risk analysis is. And it's going to be low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. And in order to avoid dental facial failures, we need to know what the risk is in dental facial. So a high smile line, 11% of the time, people saw everything shows. Medium smile line, 69%, which is about 80% pink matters. And high smile line is high risk. Medium smile line, is medium risk. Low smile on is low risk. We want a low smile on in all of our dentures and all of our cases. You don't have to worry about the gum line. It looks great, right? Anybody can hit a home run on that. But I always want them to show me your gums because 80% of the time, pink matters. And if not, sometimes they're going like this and they see it. So when a patient comes in and has a high smile on the upper and the lower, and that's called the de shin smile, and they go like this, that's a really hard case. I mean, you can't do 20. 38 teeth on that case. So you're thinking about whitening, you're thinking about minimally invasive dentistry, if possible. Now, this is video. I also use video because people move and they use still photography, but they have to see. I do see. not see my lower teeth when I smile. See my upper teeth when I smile. I only see my upper teeth when I smile. Say shush. 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 You like this. Uh. Okay. So I utilize this technology and I let them see it moving. They go, I never saw that before. And then they see their lower teeth and they go, oh, I want two teeth done. Really? You better whiten. We better do some Invisalign. What are you going to do? Here's another reason. My lower teeth when I talk. I do not see my lower teeth when I talk. I only see my upper teeth when I talk. I only see my upper teeth when I talk. And then say shush. Shush. And then say go like this. <laughs> okay. And this really helps when they see themselves in the video. This is another patient that I had that kept telling me the dentist before her um, ruined her upper teeth. They didn't make them long enough. And that I know she knows I'm going to be able to make her upper teeth long enough and everything. And, and the teeth were done 10 years ago. So I put the video on behind with no volume and all. I'm saying, I think you, you know, your upper lip has gotten longer. You've probably changed in age. I hate to tell you this, but even if I do all of your upper teeth, I can change them a little bit, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make you happy. And so now they can look and they can see that maybe someone like that, once they get done, after you do the reconstruction knows they might need a lip lift where they cut here and move it up. So utilizing this technology is really, really good. And John Coyce always says in diagnosis, you knowing what to do and knowing when to do it. And a lot of it is explaining it to the patient. You don't want to just jump in. And when you do dental facial treatment planning, you want to combine it with function. So that's how you avoid dental facial um, failures. So remember, number one is a max transcessal edge position. So this patient presents and she looks like this. And what dentistry was performed? I'm sorry, this is the post-op. Can you tell what dentistry was done? She has veneers on the uppers and natural teeth on the lower. It was a beautiful case. I think it's a beautiful case. But she came looking like this. And she goes, Joyce, I want you to do my veneers. I'm like, well, we really have to evaluate your teeth and where they are in your face. And when we look at where your teeth are in your face, the maxter incisal edge position is too low. It's tucked underneath that lower lip. 
Your front tooth is in the wrong place. I want to go from a high risk situation where she shows all of the upper gum to a medium risk situation. Push those teeth up. You want to think so, so you can move fast. So you always want to think so. Where's the front tooth? One, two, three, and four. Front tooth, back tooth, uppers. And then you don't have to, you don't have to worry about ever feeling when you do it that way. Now, I had to make her go into ortho. She didn't have a choice. Just because she doesn't want to go to ortho doesn't mean she's not going to go to ortho. She has to do ortho. And so TADS technology, as you take the TADS and then they're going to put the wires, they're going to, they're going to move them up with the rubber bands and they're going to start to intrude the teeth. Now, this patient had spaces between her teeth when she had the veneers done the first time. And he didn't do anything. So I'm doing the interproximal stripping. And as you see, as I interproximally strip her teeth, I'm getting down to the enamel because before it was just porcelain in between. So I do the stripping and I'm doing the eight by 10 rule, but I don't have to do the 10 yet because we're going to intrude them, but I'm going to go eight. And then I'm going to do the 60%. I'm using the golden rule here to know how to go interproximally, how much to take off. Then the orthodontist is going to intrude and go that way. Once I got done and got them in the right place and I removed the porcelain restoration, it's not a no prep, it's a less prep. It's all enamel. So what am I going to have a high success rate? So what do I do? I use my technology that I used with you and I put the pictures in B1A1. I use the lighter color. She decides, no, I don't like the lighter color. I want it to match the bottom teeth in the prototypes. And she signs off on the temporaries after we get the shape and the form right. She decides what side she likes and she chooses the same color from top to bottom. We go in the Mac room. We make up our little, um, laboratory prescriptions. We look at the images. She picks the incisal edges. It looks great. Everything's signed off. It matches perfect. I think it's great. She comes back the next week crying, really unhappy. I don't like my teeth. They're too yellow. I don't like the color. And so I always say, listen first and then be heard. Because obviously I'm going to go like, what? I didn't do anything wrong. We followed all the, all the techniques, everything I have, all my systems are in play. It doesn't matter what I do. Every time I turn around, it's another thing that comes. So I listened to her. We looked at everything and remember not to talk too much out loud because I do. I'm learning words have power. Control what we put in our mouths when we eat and we have to control what comes out of our mouth when we talk. I, otherwise you're going to eat your words. And this is where I should probably say, do as I say, not as I do. The problem with communication is we think it's occurred. So she signed everything off and she thinks she knows what she wants, but when she gets it, it she might want it to be a little bit different. And so I, I call the ceramics and I know we have staining and the staining for her had color in it. And so I'm going to use my Brassler striped diamond, yellow, brand new one, and I'm going to act like I have Parkinson's disease and I'm going to go a little here, a little here, a little here, a little here. So I don't take it all off. And then I'm going to polish it with polishing paste. And, and it's not a failure if you utilize these techniques because we can remove the stain. And then I'm going to use diamond impregnated wheels. The first one's going to smooth it. And then the second one is going to make it give you your gloss back also from 3M in this case. And then now she's closer to a B1 and then she's happier because it doesn't have all that yellow stain running through. And again, it's published in a uh, smilesbyjoyce.com publication page. I know I'm going quickly. I'm hitting the bullet points that are important for what we're teaching today. And that's my publication page. And now we're going to talk about bonding. And now we're going to be talking about bonding glass. In this case, either feldspathic porcelain and I'm going to use some kind of isolation, sometimes I'll opticate, sometimes cotton roll, but some kind of isolation of bite block in order to ensure that we keep everything as a clean and sterile field. And let's go ahead and bond a veneer right now. And this is again going to be published on my website, but it's also in Inside Dentistry and everything you can read it slower if you'd like. And here's your pre-op. We're going to go through a case. I think those teeth look pretty good. She hates her teeth. She wants longer teeth. She wants natural longer teeth, more of an aesthetic smile. And so I'm going to go ahead and place my direct composite mock-up on the way where I want that link to be on the tooth number nine. And then I'm going to send it in and they're going to give me a wax up. And this is going to be our diagnostic wax up. 
I'm going to cut through the facials to get our prep design. Use Galuca Rules technique. I want to keep as much enamel as possible, minimally invasive. So I'm going to try to keep an enamel ring everywhere. If there's dentin in the middle, for me, I'm using um, an etch technique where a selective etch, I don't want to have that be the part. And for me now, the cingulum is the strongest part of the tooth. So a lot of my veneers I'm wrapping and putting a little chamfer on the lingual of that area. Now here's where my hand pieces come in again. This is where I need a really good hand is piece. Is the weight of a hand piece something that's important to you? It's very, very important. I get hand fatigue. I have tiny little hands and I prep a lot and I have an electric hand piece and I can't use it for the whole procedure. By the end of the day, my hands are really, really tired and fatigued and they just hurt. So I've been using this hand piece for the last couple months and I love it because it's so lightweight. I can prep all day long. I can turn it up. I can turn it down. And at the end of the day, my hand doesn't hurt because it's so lightweight. Uh, it's great to hear. And, and when you combine it with the NLZ motor, and by the way, isn't it amazing that this is like... I can't believe how small it is. I know. It's, it's, it's so tiny and it's it's in your hand. You don't even know it's there. I feel there. like you could lose it while you're sterilizing. <laughs> it's so tiny. It's like, is this really uh, the motor for the system? And so because of the fact that they've been able to make it almost 10 millimeters shorter from here to here than its predecessor and almost four grams lighter. It's really interesting. They were able to make it so that the point of balance on the handpiece is actually in the same position as with an air rotor handpiece, which was no easy feat. Electric handpiece is typically because of the length and the weight of the motor would always pull like that. When, it, when it's in your hand now, so the balance is farther forward and it's not pulling back like that. Do you notice the feel of that huge. while you're prepping team? It's huge. Because before, my other hand pieces that I have that are electric, it's heavy right here and it causes fatigue on my arms and into my shoulder. And this one, it's so light. I feel like I can carve and contour in the, at the highest or the lowest speed, and it's like I have a paintbrush. So I have so much more control, and I feel like, like my dentistry has gotten better on the contouring side and in the finishing and the polishing because it's so lightweight. I watched you yesterday afternoon contouring some composites, and I noticed you were kind of rolling it in your hands and like it was very simple for you to do these very precise kind of movements like that one of the other things you'll notice is when you look at the the head of the 95 ls hampies it's only 13.4 millimeters tall and that's pretty tiny compared to you and i have both had electrics for a long time and our older electric hand pieces had big heads so for patients with limited openings anywhere in the posterior have you found that this 13.4 millimeter head's working well for you on like first and second molars i i prepped yesterday uh as it's an MOD composite on number 14, mm -hmm. and there is no problem getting to the distal. And I can prep the distal of number 15 on a crown prep and get a finish line, and the patient's mouth does not have to be open as well. I had a pedal bite block in there because I can get the handpiece into the back and the distal part of the posterior molars very, very simply. So I love it. I have so much more control and so much more room. Yeah, and it's funny. I used to use electrics almost everywhere, but when I had to get way back there, I couldn't get the head of my old electric campies. That's when I would have to go to an air rotor. And so it's nice to be able to do this. Now, I know dentists have concerns about maintenance and repairs with electric hand pieces because traditionally it's always been more expensive than with air rotors. NSK actually has a worry-free warranty, which is essentially a no questions asked warranty where they will do any needed repair um, for two and a half years with no questions asked. Are you more likely to work with a company that has that kind of customer service? I love it because every time I turn around, I have a bill for maintenance and it gets on my nerves after a while because I feel like my overhead, it just gets eaten alive with maintenance. So to know that I can buy this handpiece and I don't have to worry about it for two and a half years and just send it back in is exactly what I'm looking for now. I need some more security. Okay, and I really mean that too. It, it's really nice as far as I don't have to worry about it right now. I don't, and I don't have to deal with it. So, okay, so I'm, I'm done prepping my teeth. And you can see also that was before COVID. I mean, that's crazy. My hair is all pulled back now. And sometimes I have a shield on. It's crazy what we used to be like compared to now. But it is what it is. Okay, take a stump shade so the patient, um, so the ceramist can see the color. And then here we're going to take an impression in this case. So we're going analog and we're using our 3M impression material here. And here's our composite prototype provisional this DMAs again. And then the veneers come. Now we're going to go ahead almost always. First, I'm going to clean it with pumice. And then 
and try on the veneers. And then when I'm ready to bond, I'm gonna use a micro etcher. And this, uh, this course, John really taught us a lot of this. It gives you the highest value of bond strength. I use it for composite. I, and I, I use a Kojak all the time um, whenever I'm doing anything with porcelain. But in this case, we're gonna use a sandblaster and a micro etcher, and then we're gonna etch. And again, pumice when we first try it in. So try it in, and then once you're done, you're gonna clean the um, ceramics off, and then going back into the mouth when I'm ready to etch and bottom sandblasting the teeth. So that way there's really, it takes it back to, it's a reversal agent, back to its original form. You're gonna get the best bond strength. So I think that's really important in the practice for me. Now we have all of these different try-in gels. And if you needed to change the color for the veneer looting cement, and this is your trying paste. If you use the trying paste, you should rinse it off and then use acid etch on it, hydrofluoric, uh, I'm sorry, phosphoric acid etch, and you can put it in a water bath before you're ready to put it um, into putting the saline on it to put it into the mouth. So you're gonna get that ready. Now you have to ask your ceramist whether they've already done the hydrofluoric etch and whether they put the silane on it there because everybody's different. And so you need to know what your ceramist is doing. In my case, I'm, in veneers, I put the silane on in the um, operatory right before I put them on. That's the way I like to do it. You can also use bonding agent. And so we're gonna go through all that right here, depending on how you like to cement. In this case, so I'm using selective etch. I am, do not wanna over etch the dentin. And I think the middle of these props are a little dentin exposed. So I'm gonna only use the etch along the margins and on the linguals of the teeth. And remember that when we get our hybrid zone, 10 to 40 microns is what the hybrid zone is gonna be like in enamel and two to six microns in dentin. And that's why we really wanna preserve as much as possible enam enamel bonded margins because you're gonna get the less micro leakage at the interface. And so preparation design and enamel is God, it's just king. So we have to remember that. So if we're over prepping these teeth or if they already had old restorations, we may need to go to full coverage restorations and do cohesive in there and, and have that because otherwise you could get a lot of micro leakage in these areas. We want a potential hybrid zone that's really thick. We wanna really intertwine. So we wanna keep everything as moist as possible in the bonding and don't over dry it and don't let it get collapsed. Even though the new universal agents, they're saying that it doesn't matter if you do that. I still think it's important personally that we keep everything as moist and fluffy as possible. The better bonding agents, as we're getting to the newer generations, they really take away the iatrogenic dentist, which we can be at times because we don't, you know, we over etch, we over dry. And so the new, newer bonding agents, I always go to the newer generations because they have put in ingredients into those agents like MDP, et cetera, um, that are gonna help with some of the problems that we had in the past. Now, here's your Scotchman Universal and then now there's Scotchman Universal. Scotchman Universal Plus. I got to be a product tester. Thank you very much. They gave me that and the new cement. And I have to say, it's my go-to, especially if you have any problems with short preps for the Scotchman. And we're going to get into zirconia. I think we have time to get into the zirconia restorations that we're going to go into. And so that's my go-to um, bonding agent at this juncture. I used to use the Scotchman Universal, again, for um, cementing veneers. Then we have to look at the... Our, a, a thin enough film thick, thickness that you air dry it and then put the light on it before you put the cement on it. And so I always know that my restorations are ready when it looks like this, glossy, and it doesn't move. And then I put the light cure on it. Then you have to decide, are you gonna put the cement on the tooth or are you gonna put the cement on the veneer? And there was always a conversation about what you, what, which one you put it on. Obviously in a crown, you're gonna put it inside of the crown. And so whichever way you decide to do it, when you place the veneer on, and, and sometimes I put it on the tooth, sometimes I put it on the veneer, I like to put it on the tooth because then I don't think I'm gonna trap air and I put the veneer on and then I make sure that it's oozing out the sides. And then I'd rather have too much cement and clean it off then not enough cement. And I have something in the middle where there's a void. And then later, if it's a thin veneer, you can see it. So this is a very, I always tell patients, you know, you think I'm really hyper. I go hundred miles an hour. I'm more hyper when I put on a set of veneers than anything else I do. So you can't move, you can't talk, boom, boom, boom. Because it's really, you can move, ruin everything if you're not meticulous in cementation. So here I'm going to put eight and nine on first. 
clean out the cement, in this case, the right side and then the left side, clean off the cement with the brush. Now, when I use a brush, this is a different case, the lowers, I'm always gonna take the brush and wipe it from the gingival margin up to that, to that area. And I also, in my case, the cingulum is the strongest part of the tooth. I'm wrapping the lingles of these veneers and it looks like these. This is my prep design and I'm gonna wrap it. So I'm gonna get resistance for them. So they're, hopefully they're not popping off anymore. So I'm popping and I'm catching more of the tooth. In that juncture, after I clean out the cement, I'm adding flowable composite in there because I've already bonded the lingles of the tea. That way when I go to polish it, then it's gonna be super smooth in the back. So I'm cleaning the cement off and then I'm using flowable composite at the juncture of that area. That's what I do. And you need a high intensity light. And again, here I'm using, I'm using, um, the 3M light, and after it's lit is when I'm going to go in with my scalers and I'm going to go in with my saw blades. And you can see blood. I don't think that my little thing's showing, my pointer, but there's blood on the slide. And I hopefully the laser is already in there, the curing light, and it's all cemented and cured because you don't want to get blood up underneath the restoration, as you know. So clean it. If it starts to bleed, get the light on it immediately. Now on the linguals, I'm going to use a football to smooth it. And then again, I'm going to smooth it with my diamond impregnated polishing cups done, game over, quick, fast. And then once everything's complete, I'm using glycerin to complete the polymerization of the surfaces. And here are your veneers. Pre-op to post-op. Very aesthetic case. It doesn't look like she has fake teeth. They're not cosmetically oriented where they're monochromatic from the top to the bottom. She let us put um, surface texture in and incisal translucency. And so again, I show my patients these different cases so that they can decide how do they want to look? Do they want to look real? Do they want to look fake? Because I have all of them in there. And a lot of times, you know, we're always bragging and just see the 40 veneers. <laughs> yeah, right. Now we're going to look at full form monolithic restorations. Now we talked about one layer restorations, and this will be your lithium to silicate and your zirconia, where you can go monolithic. On the lithium to silicate, you could just put a stain and glaze on the facial, and the same on the zirconia. When you do full form monolithic zirconia, it can be anywhere from 650 to 1500 megapascals in strength on the full form on the, the zirconia. And the different kinds of zirconia are three Y, four Y, five Y, translucent zirconias, and again. The strength is from, they're all different. You have to know what you're utilizing and what kind of zirconia that you're utilizing when you're doing your zirconia restorations. So again, we talked about the glass being etchable because we etched it. I mean, we, we put a veneer on. The oxides, zirconias, they're not etchable at all. Okay. And on the glass ceramic restorations, you could have a flat prop like a veneer or a top of a posterior restoration. Like if you're gonna open up the vertical in the back and just put little occlusal chops on it. On the oxide ceramics, you need a circumferential preparation. So you can go thinking more about crowns and bridges on the oxide ceramics. So let's talk about the oxide ceramics. This just got published, um, what are we, March now? January, February dentistry today. And so this has another case and this is gonna be your zirconia restoration. Zirconia Restorations and 3M has a great product in this, but this patient presented smiling and this was a smile and he had a hard time getting his left lip up and he didn't like his front teeth at all. So I don't know whether I could get him to show me your gums because he wouldn't show me his gums, just couldn't do it. So his lip on the left side had laxity in it. And so I kept trying to get it up and see what's going on with the left side of his mouth. So I'm going to draw my line across again. And I'm going to look at the lip, trying to get the lip on the left side and it just wouldn't go up. So we're looking at how many restorations we're going to have to replace. And so I always look at what's in the aesthetic zone. Is that in the aesthetic zone? If it doesn't show, do I have to do it? Now he comes in because he keeps breaking his front tooth, the um, canine on the left side. And he's ready. We talk about implants to have some implant restorations accomplished. And then there's a bridge on the left side. Do I need to put an implant in the number 14 site? Well, you're going to put implants in the front. Do you want to get rid of all your bridges? Does it matter to you? How much dentistry do you want to perform? So when we go to the surgeon, 
we can see if there's enough bone availability and you can decide, do you want implants in the front, get rid of that long span bridge, and you also wanna do them on the left. And so when we looked at them smiling, is it in the aesthetic zone? How many restorations? And when you look there, you can see the number 12 tooth, the upper left first bicuspid shows, but does the next bridge show? Does he really want me to do it? And then he can decide. And that's why I like to have my cosmetic consultations talking about all this. And I write it in the email and then he decides and then he owns it. And he doesn't think I'm selling him too much dentistry. He's had a bridge his whole life. It doesn't bug him. So later he decides not to do it. He hates that they're all proclined, the inclinations. He doesn't like the way they look. He doesn't like that the right side doesn't show. He doesn't like that the front teeth are super dominant and he doesn't like that they all look like they're the same width. He thinks that they look monochromatic. Also, they're two the same color. And he describes them as piano keys. And so somebody like this, would glenn, you might wanna take them to the golden rule of proportion because this dentist used continuous proportion. He chose one side that he liked and he mimicked it on the other side, but the front teeth aren't as dominant. And so again, you need to know everything so that you can decide and have a good conversation with the patient about what you're gonna do. The more you know the stuff, the more you talk with the patient about the stuff, the smarter that you seem, the more confidence that they're gonna have in you. And then they're gonna say yes to whatever needs to be done, hopefully. All right, when I'm talking, he's talking, and I can hear his gut slushy speech. It's a hard thing to say. I go, do you realize that your S's aren't right? Well, you know, I'm, I've always talked like this, and I knew I had my teeth knocked out as a kid, and, and you know, it just bugged me. I go, well, okay, do you mind? Because I look at the backs of your restorations, and they're kind of hollowed out. I'm going to try to make them fat in the back, fuller in the back, and see if I can make your speech have a little bit less of a slushy sound. So we're gonna go ahead now and start the case. I'm gonna scan it, okay? And we're gonna send it in for our surgical template. And I'm gonna take an impression right off the bat as a backup. And so I want two things. I want a surgical template and I wanna wax up. And I'm gonna wanna wax up for eight teeth. I mean, I think I say it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine teeth. I'm leaving the bridge alone on the left side. And this is for later because I want to really build up the buccal cord, but I'm not going to do that right away. And so before he leaves on that day, I'm going to, he hates the bridge in the front. And so I take it off, I cut it off and I make a provisional with more of the widths of the centrals wider and the laterals. And I change the right side to the left side. And I'm using my provisional material again from um, 3MSB, the BIS GMA material. And then I'm going to go design right now, and we're gonna design the surgical template. And we have to know, because he's got teeth in there, six and 11, that the distance between the natural tooth and the implant is two. So when we go to design, we have to worry about number six and 11 and that we don't touch six and 11. And we have to protect the 11 root because it's angled. So when we put the 10 implant in, it's gonna be tipped because it needs two millimeters in there. So it's gonna be divergent, and it's gonna be tipped. The seventh site's parallel because the sixth tooth is parallel. So that's not, that's not gonna be a problem. And now we're gonna have two teeth that are gonna be divergent again. And remember, we want a screw retained bridge and we need one here because this thing's heavy. It's a lot heavier, this bridge, than a single unit. And we really don't wanna cement it if we can help it. So the path of insertion is gonna be divergent. So we have the surgical template made and the patient comes back and I'm gonna remove the composite prototype in the front and I'm gonna try my template in and then it goes on, it's fine. And then it's gonna to go to the surgeon for the implants and he goes to the surgeon for the implants cause he's scared for the surgeon to take it off, my temporary. And the implants are placed. And then I'm worried about that S, the typical, you need one millimeter of space between the front teeth for the S sound to be crisp. Okay, so let S be your guide is what they say. That's your closest speaking sound. So when I have my new nine unit design designed, I have them make it an MIP and then really fat in the palate from seven through 10 in that area. So look at the difference in the design from what I have to what he has. Then when I put it in the temporaries, the new set, I'm gonna 
carve that back a little so that it's not in his chewing pattern. And then I'm gonna let him wear for a while to see if I can correct his S's. Now I'm gonna make this while those implants are being integrated. I'm gonna get him back in, take off these back teeth and put this new composite prototype provisional bis GMA restoration. Now, if this doesn't work, the next thing I can do is close the vertical. But in order to close the vertical, I got to close these back teeth down. So I'm hoping because that will close the vertical, that will close the speaking space. That will help too. It's another thing that you can do. Patient says, when am I going to get my teeth? I say, when are you going to sign off? And then he was so meticulous. This was his prescription. And Eamon took pictures of all of the different angles that he wanted. And he really designed his teeth. He hated his teeth for his whole life and he wanted what he wanted. And these forms really help the patient design. And then they like their teeth and they go back and forth with their wives and their wives help them design. They love it. And then he gets what he wants. This is what he designed. This, his vision is in the prototype. He dictates what he wants. Now I'm going to go and take off the temps and pack my cord, no matter what you have to pack cord, you can scan or you can take an analog. In this case, again, I'm in the analog world with my 3M impression material. And I'm gonna take shade tabs of different colors with whatever stump it is. So the ceramic knows, cause what if they're using the translucent zirconias? What are they gonna do so they can make sure that they can block out this area? And I'm gonna take my fixture level impression, send it to the lab, and then they're gonna scan. I'm gonna scan my, my um, temporaries and they're going to design the teeth to match the provisionals and so once they get in there they have the, the provisionals and they have to make it look exactly the same and they use the sheet because they're going to change some of the shapes and the forms because it's not perfect and they're going to do intentional design changes and that comes in white and the provisional is going to be in purple. So you can look to see how they changed it to make them the shape that you want. And you can be a part of this with the ceramics. I can send you these pictures and from three shape, or you can do it yourself. However you want to do it. They're going to lay the design over the props. And, and the number 12 tooth from the margin to the facial contour is going to be steep. Cause remember, I'm trying to make it fuller because that lip needs support on that side to make it look better. And so it's going to be one of those steep ones again. The patient has to know and has to keep it clean in that area. And the white design is going to be for the abutment. And the yellow is going to be the path of insertion for the screw access. So you can see that we have a problem here. When we overlay the zirconia design over the abutments, the next thing you can press a button in these two areas here, you can see where the screws come in. And the pink is a minimum thickness. So now we can see, is it going to work? What I love about this technology is it doesn't let you screw it up. It's going to guide you. It's your GPS. And you can see where it's too thin and where it's too thick. And this is what the lab does. But we need to know what they're doing, I believe. And that's what this, this is about. This is about CAD CAM, designing and manufacturing also what their portion is. So we can learn what they're doing. So pink is a minimal thickness. Then we're going to attach the design to the margins. We're going to verify the exact duplication by overlaying the approved provisionals. And then we're going to look at the screw access angles. And when we look at these angles, you can see if we don't have angled screw abutments, they're going to go out the facials of seven and 10. We're going to have a problem like the other case was. But in this case, because they're such big implants, we can choose whatever we want. We can change the angles of these screw accesses because they have this true abutment that can come in and then we can change it. Red is the handle. And then they take it in the technology and they change it and they move it and they angle it out and use it. they alter that path with the angled to a screw channel. So we need an angled screwdriver and angled screws. I don't know this. They send them to me in the case for microdental, thank God. And they send me the screws, of course, but they send me the driver because otherwise I have the straight drivers and I didn't have an angle driver. So I was really excited when they told me <laughs> and then I can do what I need to do because I have to have complete communication with my ceramics because I don't know what's going on otherwise. I just really don't understand their portion of it, but they guide me. They, I believe I outsource so much of the technology. I personally outsource a lot of the specialty work. I think that I feel good about what I do on my side, but I need help and they help me a lot. So there's a lot of dentists now though that are doing everything on their own and they're learning it all. And I think it's great, but just make sure you get the right training and make sure that you have people to help guide you so you don't get in trouble because it's really a nightmare when you get in trouble.
So this is your original design. This is the first cutback. This is the final cutback. You can cut back and use the layering porcelains over the top. And now it's final and it's ready for the mill. They position the design in the pucks. They place the pucks in the milling machine. They mill. And now we have the screw retained restoration in the front and the cement retained restorations of single units in the posterior. And now here's your lava aesthetic restorations that you can use as your zirconia. And you can clean it and you can't etch it, but you can bond it because they're not etchable. Saliva contains phosphates and it sticks and it will not rinse off. So zirconia oxides, um, you cannot use phosphoric acid etch on any of the zirconias. It will make it worse. So here's your sandblaster again, and you can use your prep start sil jet for zirconia, and you can sandblast the insides of your zirconia to clean it. It increases the surface roughness. And then when you bond to zirconia, you need MDP. And so here you have your scotch bond, your new plus, it has MDP in it. So you can utilize that inside of the restoration, but with the new cement, you don't have to um, you can just use it 100% with the cements because the cement also has it in there. And that's your new 3M Rely X Universal. And personally, I like to, to use both the binding agent and the cement because I, I always like bolts and suspenders. And so now with the new material that's coming out, you can utilize that, the orange 3M Universal to bond all your zirconia. And it has the highest bond strengths. And that came out of um, Sabia's group. There, I'm sorry, I'm having a thing out of uh, Michigan. They just did a whole report on how great the bonding is on zirconia. It's like the best bond strength for zirconia restorations is a 3M Relyx Universal. Now they have another cement called Unisum. And so it depends on the preparation. And when do you use what? Now, if you have a really short prep, then you want at least four millimeters. You know that you're gonna need an adhesive cement. There's more steps involved. But if you have a less reprinted, a retentive prep, it's, it works, okay? Because you need to bond it. So you have a short prep. The bond strength is a lot stronger with adhesive cements. The fracture toughness of the restoration is higher. And so in this case, I'm gonna definitely go to my plus, my 3M plus, the new materials is what I'm gonna utilize for this. Now, if you wanna use a self-adhesive cement, you have to make sure that you have a four millimeter length and only a four degree taper. So it can't be tapered. It can't be TP prep. And then you can utilize the squirt and go. I call it because everything is self-adhesive in one of the, um, everything's in there, the etch and the bond. Everything's there. And you can use that for your lava aesthetics, all zirconia and Kois, John Kois, and, and that's all he uses. He uses Unison for everything on everything. So, but I personally believe you should use the new, cement um, because it's going to be even stronger going forward, especially if you have shorter props. So here we have longer props. So you can utilize either of the two, depending on what you wanted to utilize there, but now you have choices. And so this patient smiles and I really think the new materials before they weren't as pretty, but now they rival the aesthetic lavas. They rival the older materials because they're just becoming more aesthetic and they're more translucent and it's more beautiful. I hope that this was not just a pearl, it was a string of pearls. But I really wanna talk about failures because I did the failure symposium for John Coyson and, and then I did a whole thing on failures and qualities for success. I always compare myself to all my friends and, and I would always feel like I was not as good as everybody else. And now I try to not compare myself to anybody else and only compare myself to myself. Am I better today than I was yesterday? And I have to derive meanings from my circumstances because I always go, why is this happening to me? I can't believe this is happening. I'm kind of like a drama queen. And I have to think this is not happening to me. This is happening for me. And you don't lose if you don't lose the lesson because every time one of these failures happen, I'm not a loser. I'm learning something new and I'm moving into the future in a better way. Errors are stigmatized. And we have to learn from other people's failures because we're not going to live long enough to learn from all of our own. So I want to thank everybody. It's hard to listen for that long. I hope 
I can get this to let me stop sharing my screen. Oh, do I want us to see questions and answers? How much do, uh, time do you usually take for a full consult? Okay. This is what, one of the best things that happened in my practice is that there was a, a couple of hygienists that left my practice um, and they put ads in the paper where they were at and then half my practice left and they went to another practice, which opened up my practice for spending more time with consults. And because I was like freaking out, I lost half my practice. And then when I spent more time with my consults, I, I, I created more value for the patient and I could sell bigger cases. So if you are going to try to sell, if you want to do this kind of dentistry, you want to do more bigger cases, you have to set aside the time for the consults. If you're in your, if you're at a PPO practice and you see this happening and this patient really is going to be something that's a bigger case, don't do it that day. Just don't tell them you want to take records, take scans, take impressions, do whatever you need and pictures. You need pictures. I'm sorry. And tell me you want them to come back. And that if they really want to know what's going to happen, that they need to give you an hour of their time. I don't know where you're gonna find it in your schedule. I don't know if you stay later at the end of the day, you come in earlier in the day, you don't take a lunch that day, and you explain it to them that you need an hour of their time, 45 minutes to an hour. And then I'm not, I'm not gonna give free consultations on virtual websites. I know I'm gonna be the opposite, you guys. Doesn't mean you can't do it. A lot of people do it, they go fast, they have their team, have all of the befores and afters, and then they kind of just go in and say hello, and then they come back for the consultation with the doctor. You guys decide how you want to design it. I don't want to do that personally. So you're going to hear my perspective, and it doesn't mean it's right. It's like spaghetti on the wall, what sticks. I believe I need to do the consultation. I believe I need to put their pictures up and explain everything like I showed you here. I, I believe I need that email because I have a higher higher creating value and they say yes. And if they don't say yes, they say yes to something in there. And I do it with those patients. So I'm going an hour. Some people go longer. I charge them. Sometimes I decrease the fee if I think I'm going to lose them, but I charge them. Am I allowed to chart to say this? Is this going to go in a problem? I charge so much for the photographs. I'm going to tell you 150 because I take all those photographs with video. I charge 175 for a comprehensive oral exam. I charge 175 for my x-rays. I hope that it's not. I free for the scan for an F full series of x-rays. Free for the scan, usually free for the scan. And then if they need a cosmetic consultation, I'm going to go into the room. I charge another 175, but a lot of times I'll get rid of that fee because when I start adding it up, it's too much. It's $700. I'm not going to go there. It's too much money. So I go, well, if you do all of this other stuff, then the doctor will allow the cosmetic consult for free if you do it all at the same time. X-rays, comprehensive exam, scan, and photos. And then we'll decrease that fee. And then maybe it's $500 or $525. Most of the time, they're going to bring X-rays from another place, and it could be $375. But they know they're going to pay. And they go, well, we can get a free consult somewhere else. We're not doing that here. You're, you're, and you could say this, you have a complex rehab case. You don't want a free consultation. We need to be paid for our time. Are you okay with paying this much money, but you're going to be with her for an hour or an hour and 15 minutes. And by the time you leave, you're going to know everything about your smile, everything about your bite, everything about your function, because they're going to look at those pictures. And, and then, and hopefully you create an email or somebody's typing. So they see it, or you can do a video on it. That's how I do it. I, I hope that that helps and answers that question, but that's kind of how I'm doing it now. Okay. I don't charge for my time. I charge for my procedures. Um, and then also they're asking me about charges. I have a range. So when people, how much is your crown? Well, a posterior crown that I'm just going to do easy and quick is a lot less lower range. And I can use, I, I can just, it's, it's going to be a lower range for single unit crowns. When I'm going to do a case, I'm going to charge for the wax up. I'm going to charge, if I don't have a wax up, and a lot of times I do it in the mouth myself, direct composite bonding in the mouth, I might charge a miscellaneous fee for depending how many teeth I'm doing. So if I'm going to do four teeth in the front, I'm going to charge a miscellaneous fee of $1,000 for me to do a diagnostic wax up in their face, in their mouth, take my impression, and then I have my composite prototype temporaries made after that. And so that's going to be a separate fee in the case fee. And then so much per unit. And then S6 retainer upper, S6 retainer lower, so nothing shifts. And if they're a grinder, a night guard. So that's kind of how I, I do that. I customize everything. And we say on the phone, or we say to the patients, this is an out-of-the-box kind of case. This is a complex rehabilitation case. This is not 
this, you have to charge more for these cases. So you have to figure out their insurance is only going to pay 2000 a year anyway. So right. Or 1500 or 1200 if they're on a PPO plan. And so then you have to figure out where well, you're going to have all these teeth done at the same time. You can't, they have to pay out of pocket. So this is like, you're going to a plastic surgeon, you're getting your face done. You're going somewhere, you have to pay and you want the best person to do it. You want somebody that knows how to do it and that they're going to have longevity of the restorations. And you have to create value for that patient. That's your patient. And they don't want to go anywhere else. They're going to do it with you because of that. So that's, that's that question. Okay. I am going to say that they just asked me about the product lines from 3M and Yes, I love the product lines from 3M. I, I've been working with 3M for, th I don't know, 25, 30 years. I, I've, I have every generation of their composites and I love the new composite. I always go to the next generation because I believe that as the new generations occur, they are changing the formulations and the filler size particles of the composites and they get better. They're polished, their polishability is better and usually they're stronger because they have silica particles in there and, and sometimes they're conia particles in the new composites. And I, I can't wait for them to come up with a new product line. And now they also match better because everybody's figuring out how to change the powder particle sizes to a level where it, you can have less number of composites, um, colors, and they blend in better. So you don't need 50 composites anymore. You can go with 10 different shades. So the next question is about the composites. Okay. I don't have any other questions, Lisa. I know I'm, I'm done a little bit early, a couple minutes. Thank you oh, so much. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.